How are you folks doing? How are you folks doing? You've enjoyed all the rain. Yeah, I'm the one that predicted that you'd have uh, uh, a number of days of really good weather and to get out and enjoy the sun and uh, get rid of the winter chill. Uh, now you know why I never got into meteorology. Yeah, so forget any weather report I'm ever going to give you. Okay, but what we're going to do in this module is we're going to end the Second World War and uh, by concentrating on the war in the Pacific, uh, that is the war against Japan, a vastly different undertaking than the war against Germany. Uh, completely different type of war in that uh, this one, we will be concentrating a great deal on the uh, on the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Naval Air Force, which means, of course, uh, aircraft uh, taken from aircraft carriers, as well as the United States Army Air Forces in the strategic bombing of Japan. Uh, of course, the Army and the Marine Corps did play significant roles but this is a war that uh, is very much a naval and air contest between Japan and the United States. Uh, first of all, a word or two about Japan. This is not the Japan you folks know today. Uh, this is far from it. Uh, Japan in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, uh, until the end of the Second World War, was a highly militarized, intensely nationalistic society. It was an extremely extremely militaristic group of individuals that governed Japan. This was reflected in the educational system, in the use of religion to reinforce the nationalism and the militarism throughout the society, throughout the society. The, the religion in particular uh, should be outlined. Uh, it's the Shinto faith, it's S-H-I-N-T-O. And this faith uh, was uh, rather disciplined and encouraged by the army in particular, uh, the army being probably the most significant force in the Japan of this day. Combining the Shinto faith, highly disciplined, with that of Japanese cultural traditions, which was a, a cultural background that owed extreme loyalty to the leader. The leader in the case of our Japan here would be the emperor, the Showa, uh, the emperor Hirohito, H-I-R-O-H-I-T-O, uh, the emperor, the god emperor of Japan, the individual who would, uh, from his family ancestors, represent God's protection of the Japanese people. Uh, the Japanese people in Japan, uh, in Japanese is Nippon, N-I-P-P-O-N. The faith reinforced the army's desire to have a very, very disciplined workforce and a very loyal citizenry that would serve to protect the army's place in society, the army's place in government, and the army's role in foreign relations running just an inch or so behind the army would be the Imperial Japanese Navy. The IJN and the IJA would both essentially rule the country, rule the country. Now there were civilian members of the cabinet uh, that uh, supposedly advised the emperor who was the head of state. Well, the emperor was more of a symbolic head of state. Hirohito was a godlike presence, but the emperor Hirohito was not necessarily interested in giving his opinion to the military, nor was the military interested in hearing his opinion if it differed from theirs. The emperor was a tightly controlled individual, tightly controlled by both army in particular and by navy and by the political culture and the culture of the court. Uh, Hirohito has been, uh, uh, was regarded as a war criminal by the United States after the war, but uh, it was recognized that Japan would never have surrendered if the allies were going to try Hirohito as a war criminal. So a compromise was made in American public opinion, and Hirohito was allowed to continue as a constitutional monarch. He would die a very old man in the late 1990s, I believe, 1997. I'll take a guess at that date. So the Army and the Navy, 
essentially ruled this, this country, this country that is consumed by radical nationalism, along with radical nationalism, radical imperialism, radical militarism, limited, very limited civilian influence in government on any level, very limited. Uh, Japan itself invaded Manchuria, uh, an area that doesn't exist on the map anymore. Uh, but uh, if you just uh, cross the Sea of Japan, you will end up in Korea, which was a Japanese colony. North and South Korea did not exist at that time. It was just the Korean colony of Japan. Uh, and the Japanese treated Koreans very much the way uh, Americans in, in, for the longest time in our history, treated Black Americans. They were regarded as little more than human, and uh, they were just uh, used as laborers by the Japanese economy and by the Japanese military. They had very limited civil rights, if any rights at all. Manchuria, if you just continue north out of Korea, you will come into the Manchurian part of what is now Asia, Mongolia, and, and parts of the Soviet Union. The Japanese army and the army alone invaded Manchuria in 1931. The government did not order the army to invade Manchuria. Right-wing militarists, junior officers in the Japanese army staged the attack and forced the government to go along with it. Uh, I mentioned the government was radical. Well, radical extremism, absolutely. This war in China, uh, or in Manchuria, would continue for six years. The Japanese would by and large control the population in Manchuria, but then the Japanese enlarged the war by attacking China in 1937. China is a huge country with a huge population. Japan had 72 or 3 million people at this time frame, and of course China's population dwarfed Japan, and Japan is a relatively small piece of real estate, and China is massive in comparison. Uh, and China is still massive in comparison to just about any of its neighbors, with the exception of Russia, which is big, but it's not China big. This war would continue until 1945. Indeed, most of the Japanese army, the Imperial Japanese Army, would remain fighting in China from 1937 till 1945. It would not be used in the Second World War against the United States, the British, and the Dutch it would be only used against the Chinese. So Japan was already fighting a war on one front, which was draining Japan financially, economically, industrially, and militarily. Japan was already involved in what amounted to pretty, pretty close to a total war. J Japanese aggression in China resulted in the Western powers, particularly the United States, stepping in and urging the China, the Japanese to withdraw. Now, Japan would never have withdrawn on the basis of negotiations. This was absolutely absurd. The Japanese never even considered it. Franklin Roosevelt and the U.S. State Department uh, hoped that the Japanese would, and to encourage them, they froze all Japanese uh, investments in the United States. And essentially, the Japanese weren't able to take any money they were making by investing in American, uh, American stocks or in American industry. In addition, the United States, the British, and the Dutch, who controlled the East Indies, uh, an oil producing area, they all arranged to cut off any export of oil to Japan. Why did this matter? It mattered a great deal, because like the United Kingdom, Japan is an island nation, a maritime nation. It needed to import as much, as many natural resources as it could in order to keep its civilian population comfortable and in order to produce anything that a modern state needed to produce, steel, etc. Now, the Japanese also needed food to be imported. Uh, Japanese did not produce enough to main, maintain itself either as a civilian society or as even a moderate middle range power. Japan regarded itself as a first rate power. Therefore, natural resources had to be brought in 
in cutting off investments, in cutting off oil, in particular oil. What the United States did is it posed a significant threat to the Japanese status quo. The civilian part of the economy could not accept the American embargo of oil and investments. The military side of the Japanese state could never even begin to accept the cutoff. The Navy in particular desperately needed oil. Navy ships moved on oil. Uh, the Army could manage without oil, but of course, for the few vehicles it had, the Army did need oil. The Army certainly needed steel, and that could only be imported. Japan was faced with some serious problems here. They needed food for civilians, oil for the military, steel for the military, and they could not do it. They could not buy it because of the draining on their financial resources. They would not withdraw from China. The only option was to attack, to wage war, to seize the natural resources that were needed. That inevitably, inevitably meant war with the United States, war with the British, and war with the Dutch. Now, the British and the Dutch did not worry the Japanese so much. After all, uh, the Netherlands had been conquered by Germany in 1940, so they didn't have much in the uh, in the Pacific area except control of the Dutch East Indies, call it modern day Indonesia, uh, a very large, a very large state. And the British were very preoccupied with just surviving against the Germans. So the main threat was the United States. The United States is not totally innocent in, in starting this war. The United States regarded the Pacific Ocean as an American ocean, uh, frequently called an American lake. The Japanese in the Japanese Navy and the Japanese thrust for colonies represented a direct threat to American investment in Asia, to American colonies in Asia and the Pacific. So Roosevelt perhaps was pushing Japan to get out of China, knowing that they wouldn't. It all depends upon your point of view. Regardless, a conflict between the two powers had been anticipated by both Tokyo and Washington ever since the end of the First World War. Uh, many people say that a conflict with China in our world is inevitable. You can make a very good case that uh, uh, we are already in a quasi war with uh, with China, owing to uh, economic economic measures and financial measures undertaken by both countries to throttle the other. It uh, will it come to a war? Oh well, dear God, I hope not. I hope not. Japan was not a powerful country by the definition of powerful countries, uh, which included a safe and strong economy. By a safe economy, it meant, I mean, one that is uh, has a plentiful supply of natural resources. If they have to be imported, that means that they have a strong merchant fleet that is well protected by the Navy and perhaps uh, only uh, dealing with uh, importing raw materials from safe regions of the world that were not involved in war. Japan, therefore, did not have a safe economy, did not have one because they were at war and the natural resources were being denied them uh, by those countries uh, uh, and colonies in the Pacific that were, in theory, at peace, but in reality had embargoed them. Japan, therefore, faced the rather serious problem of going to war against an industrial superpower like the United States. To put it uh, rather in a convenient term, American industry, while powerful, uh, the Japanese industry was sufficiently powerful to build the armed force it had, but Jap Japan's industry only amounted in peacetime to roughly 10% of American industrial power when America was still at peace. When it came time to gearing up for war, uh, 
Japan's economy would have to fight for natural resources to be uh, to be imported. They would be under attack from the air by uh, American bombers. So they're 10% of the American peacetime peacetime industrial power would be hammered down in wartime, while American peacetime industry would grow proportionally in a very short amount of time, uh, a very limited amount of time, the Japanese, if they had behaved rationally, would have realized that uh, there was simply no way that they could defeat the United States of America while simultaneously fighting the Japanese, uh, fighting the Chinese in China, while simultaneously also attacking British possessions in Southeast Asia. Ultimately, the British, in defeating the Germans, would be sending more and more ground troops, air, sub, air, air formations, and the Royal Navy to contest the Japanese. In addition, Japan always had to worry about the Soviet Union, Russia, because Manchuria and Japanese holdings in Korea all bordered Russia. And they had already had a small series of battles with the Russians in before the war, and the Japanese army had been roundly bounced back by the uh, strong tank forces of the Russian army. So Japan had a number of real and potential enemies. To engage in war at this time, it was folly. It just literally made no rational sense. But then again, if you're speaking with ultra nationalists, with ultra militarists, then common sense and rational decision making have pretty much already left the conversation. Pretty much already left the conversation. Japan would be severely overstretched in this conflict, severely overstretched. And the tragedy of, the, of this entire problem for Japan lay in the fact that the uh, Japanese admirals, the Navy commanders, had war-gamed a war against the United States before the attack on Pearl Harbor. They had war-gamed. What that essentially means is the admirals uh, got together and uh, using their knowledge of their own fleet, their knowledge of the American fleet, and then making these uh, these projections as to how these fleets and their air support and their supplies would grow in the event of a war, the Japanese had gamed it out a number of times. Each time, Japan lost. The Navy High Command knew it. The Navy High Command knew it. Nonetheless, the games towards the final gaming of this, uh, of this, uh, proje this projected war uh, the Navy finally uh, worked on the rules so as to uh, make it almost inevitable that Japan could triumph. Japan could triumph. Uh, this is insanity. This is insane. This makes no rational sense. Okay, now that's a bit of the background here. Uh, where Germany was the main enemy in Europe, the Italians uh, and uh, Romanians, Hungarians, Germany had a number of allies. Uh, Japan was the only enemy in the war in Asia. Uh, this Japan, uh, as I mentioned, is very much interested in imperialism, uh, grabbing more colonies at the point of a knife, and strongly militaristic and nationalistic. It was a united country, a united country firmly firmly in control of, of the nationalists, of the nationalists. So Japan's military strength primarily lay in her air forces and Navy. Now, the Imperial Japanese Army had its own air force. The Imperial Japanese Navy had its own air force. Uh, the Japanese did not have a Marine Corps. Uh, many people feel that uh, there were a number of uh, small uh, Navy uh, ground detachments that were the equivalent of the U.S. Marines, but no, that is just not true. If anyone says that, they're talking about the Special Naval Landing Forces, which were very small. And the United States Marine Corps grew by leaps and bounds and had six full divisions of 28,000 men each, plus its own Air Force, 
So it had uh, Japan had nothing equivalent to it. But of these these formations, the Japanese Navy, the Imperial Japanese Navy, was a large, efficient force composed of modern aircraft carriers and a number of uh, a large number of superbly trained naval air crew pilots bombardiers etc and a very fine set of officers and men on board the warships on board the warships her naval aircraft uh, called the zero capital z e r o uh, was a a fighter plane that was the best naval combat plane in the world in 1941 and 1942 Naval, naval fighters compared to ground fighters, there's always a significant difference, always a significant difference. Not so much nowadays uh, because the carriers are bigger and the, uh, the design of aircraft is, uh, is, is far different uh, than it was then. But uh, uh, Japan's Zeros could fight land-based aircraft and could also fight uh, American carrier-based aircraft. These uh, these aircraft. The problem with Japan's aircraft industry was that while it could produce fine aircraft, long-ranged aircraft, there were some deep flaws. They did not have gas tanks that could resist weapons fire. Uh, Allied aircraft could. It's something called a self-sealing gas tank. In other words, it wasn't flammable. Uh, the Japanese Zero caught fire very quickly if it was hit by machine guns or cannon fire, as did Japanese bomber aircraft. But the Zero was a, a very high performance aircraft, very long range with an outstanding pilot in 1941, 1942. The Japanese army, on the other hand, was very much a World War I army, relying almost exclusively on horsepower to move anything. Uh, they had very few tanks. Those that they did have uh, were some of the worst tanks ever produced by any major country in the Second World War. Their artillery was uh, inadequate at best. It was, uh, it was hardly modern, nor did they have that much of it. And the guns were relatively short range. They had very few motor vehicles to move the artillery or to move the infantry and to move supplies. Again, horse-drawn, horse-drawn supply wagons. Think of it that way. Um, their machine guns were a step above World War I quality. The main Japanese uh, uh, infantry firearm, the Arasaka rifle, was, uh, was inadequate. It was a bolt-action, single-shot rifle. It could no way, shape, or form compare to the American M1 semi-automatic rifle. Also, the Japanese uh, uh, marksmanship was uh, way below standard, way below standard. The Japanese army was trained in discipline, but it wasn't necessarily trained in combat tactics. They had succeeded and done very well against the Chinese armies, which were similarly poorly trained and uh, just led by, by some totally incompetent officers. Japan's army did improve as the war went on. It improved in no small way, because say what you will about Japanese preparations for war, but the individual Japanese soldier, sailor, and airman represented the capstone in courage, bravery, and endurance. Indeed, some of the World War I veterans uh, whom I got to know in my, uh, uh, well, far, far a long time ago, and, and now they're mostly gone, but the, uh, the men uh, that I interviewed, uh, a number of them said uh, that uh, the average Japanese soldier that they fought would be worthy of a Medal of Honor if he was serving in American ground forces. I even heard this from a number of men who despised the Japanese hated them. Uh, one or two of them admitted that they never took prisoners, never took prisoners. Uh, the ones that uh, the men I interviewed that fought the Germans and the Italians, you know, they, they did not behave that way 
uh, towards those enemies, uh, the way they behaved, uh, uh, the veterans behaved about the Japanese. Principally, uh, I would believe this is due to Pearl Harbor. Uh, many people mention it's also due to racism. Well, you can counter that by saying that the Japanese people were amongst the most racist, racist oriented in the world in that time frame, in that time frame. Uh, I mentioned the way the Japanese treated the Koreans, the way the Japanese treated the Chinese was even worse, was even worse. Uh, racism is not an exclusive product of a white American uh, background nor a European American, a European background. Racism exists everywhere, everywhere, and uh, bigotry just runs hand in glove with it. Uh, but the Japanese soldier, on the basis of his self-discipline, the discipline imposed by the military and by civil society, was an extraordinary fighting man. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. Uh, what Napoleon said about the Russians, I will say about the Japanese. It wasn't enough to kill him. You then had to knock him down. Okay. Now, Japan's decision for war was very much an army oriented decision. The Navy needed oil, but the Navy did not wish to go to war against the United States Navy. They wished to be able to build up the Japanese Navy much more before they would even consider that. However, the oil embargo uh, took the power of decision away from the Japanese admirals, in particular uh, Admiral Yamamoto. Uh, that's spelled Y-A-M-A. O-T-O, -O, Yamamoto. Uh, you will see his, his photograph in, in the PowerPoint and a brief explanation of him. But Yamamoto did not wish for this war. And indeed, he, uh, his life was in danger because he made no secret that he was against fighting the Americans because he didn't think Japan had a ghost of a chance against the Americans. The army apparently was trying to assassinate him. This was not uncommon for the army in pre-war Japan. If you disagreed with the army as a politician or as an admiral or a general, uh, you were putting your life in your hands. So the Navy, the Navy chief of staff sent Yamamoto to a permanent station on board a warship where he could be, be protected from the violent Japanese army extremists. So they wouldn't hurt him or kill him or kill him. Hell of a society, isn't it? Hell of a society that they had there. Yamamoto was finally given the orders by the high command that there was no choice, that uh, we will have to stage an attack on the United States. Yamamoto said, let me manage this. This is the origin of the plan to attack Pearl Harbor. There would be no declaration of war beforehand. The Japanese had been at war with Russia in 1905, and Japan struck first. Uh, they did not declare on a war on Russia. They also did not declare a war on China. They struck first. Uh, Japanese felt that this gave them a significant advantage at war start. It's hard to argue with that uh, on one level. On a moral and ethical level, of course you can argue with it. But war and uh, morality and ethics usually have very little to do with, uh, with war. Uh, decisions for war or otherwise. Yamamoto's plan was literally uh, the, the exception to most Japanese plans made in this conflict in that it was brilliant. Uh, Japanese plans were usually less than brilliant when compared to American uh, offensive and defensive plans. Yamamoto insisted that the American fleet based at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii should be attacked by a surprise aerial offensive. Now, the only way for aircraft to attack Pearl Harbor was to be launched from Japanese aircraft carriers. So what Yamamoto did is he grouped all six of the largest and most modern Japanese aircraft carriers into one task force, six carriers in one task force. No country in war or peacetime had ever done such a thing. The uh, many members of the Japanese Navy said this was a, a critical mistake because it would put all of their warships in literally in one spot in the ocean, and it was far too dangerous. 
Yamamoto said, we're at peace. They're going to be sailing in secret, cut off from all radio communication, and the surprise strike will be launched from an area that the United States doesn't expect. They'll be launched from the north, not from the west. So the admirals reluctantly agreed, and Yamamoto set forth. Yamamoto's fleet set forth. Excuse me, he stayed in Japan. The fleet would leave its Japanese bases and go way into the North Pacific, a hostile uh, body of water. It's like the North Atlantic. It's very treacherous. They went into the North Pacific with complete radio silence until they were north, directly north of Hawaii, keeping radio silence the entire time. American intelligence was fooled. They thought the Japanese fleet was in port back in the home islands of Japan. December 7th, 1941, at 7.55 a.m. in the morning, the United States would learn that the Japanese carriers were not at home. Uh, December 7th is our date for the attack. Once you cross the, uh, the international date line in the Pacific, it automatically goes a day ahead. So in the Japanese calendar, it was December 8th, 1941. This attack was brilliant in its planning. And the American battle fleet at Pearl Harbor was caught absolutely off guard. Uh, the, uh, all of the American Army and Naval aircraft uh, stationed in the various air forces around the Pearl Harbor, air, uh, Pearl Harbor Naval Base, all of them were on the ground, caught totally by surprise. Uh, the first wave of the Japanese uh, naval aircraft came in and were aimed at striking the airfields, the airfields, the Army and Navy airfields, and did a very fine job. Uh, they managed to destroy the majority of the aircraft that were lined up in peacetime formation. After all, it was Sunday morning, we were at peace. Why worry? Um, yeah, it was like 9-11 in 2001. Who expected this? But uh, after the airfields had been uh, sufficiently damaged, then the Japanese naval aviators went after the fleet in Pearl Harbor. The Pearl Harbor base was also a base for the U.S. naval, uh, U.S. Navy aircraft carriers. Fortunately for the United States, the aircraft carriers based in the Pacific were not in Pearl Harbor at the time. Uh, they were going off on various missions or training maneuvers. Uh, but there were eight battleships in Pearl Harbor. All eight of these ships were old, uh, dramatically in need of modernization. They were not the best and the brightest of the American battle fleet, but they still were battleships and highly and very much usable in a war, in a war. Uh, Japan struck them and struck them hard uh, with both their uh, their well-trained dive bombers and their equally well-trained torpedo carrying aircraft. Uh, the torpedo bombers and the dive bombers did a, well, did a fine job, did a fine job in attacking the U.S. battle fleet. Of the eight battleships, seven would be very badly damaged or destroyed or felt to be destroyed. The one that uh, avoided serious damage uh, was the USS Pennsylvania. But her colleagues, the, uh, the Arizona, Nevada, Tennessee, West Virginia, Maryland, Oklahoma, and California, I can never remember the names of all of them, uh, they were all hit. Uh, some of them were actually, it was felt they had been sunk, uh, but they were in port. So when they sank, they essentially went, uh, ports are always relatively shallow. So it's not if you're, you're sinking in the Pacific Ocean where you, know, you can't raise the ship again, but the, the battleships with the exception of two could be raised and rebuilt and they would serve again in the Second World War. The Pennsylvania didn't have to be rebuilt, just worked on. Two though, the Nevada and the Oklahoma, I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, the, the Arizona and the Oklahoma would be officially classified as destroyed. The Oklahoma had capsized uh, when they raised her from the, uh, the bottom of the, uh, the harbor. They realized that uh, just 
wasn't there wasn't any way it could be it could be rebuilt it was towed out from the pacific and uh, mercifully sent under the water to its to its grave the arizona is still at pearl harbor a bomb had exploded in a, a dive bomber had hit the arizona in its uh, ammunition supply area it's called a magazine of all things on board the arizona and the arizona's explosion would shatter windows in honolulu it was so powerful Honolulu is right next to Pearl Harbor. It's actually part of the city for all intents and purposes. Uh, the Arizona would immediately just kind of drop down into the water. It is still there as a national monument, as a national monument. The action at Pearl Harbor would be a severe, a severe defeat for the United States. Japan lost nine fighter planes, each of them with one pilot. Uh, they lost 15 dive bombers and five torpedo bombers, 29 planes, 29 planes. They also lost one submarine, which never penetrated Pearl Harbor, and five midget submarines, two-man submarines, that had uh, managed to sneak themselves into Pearl Harbor. Uh, and uh, uh, the crew on the uh, the main submarine and the uh, five midget submarines, uh, the crews all were died except for one prisoner, uh, one of the men on the uh, a sailor on the midget submarine, and he was the first Japanese prisoner of war taken in World War II. The fighter, dive bomber, and torpedo bomber air crews were all killed. That amounted to 55 Japanese air crew, 121 submarine crewmen. This is, relatively speaking, an insignificant loss. Uh, the United States had lost the battleships Arizona and Oklahoma. Other ships had been hit. Uh, the U.S. suffered 2,403 dead, 1,178 wounded. It's a total of 3,581 killed and wounded against 35 Japanese. Of the 2,403 killed in the neighborhood of 50% of those Americans died in the explosion on board the Arizona. The Japanese offensive actions were simultaneously staged with the Pearl Harbor raid all across the Pacific. The American owned, it was a colony, the Philippines, uh, spelled P H I L 1 L I P P 2 P's, I N E S. Uh, the Philippines, an American colony, was attacked on December 8th, 1941 the same day as December 7th, remember that international date line, uh, with a shattering attack on American airfields. The American commander of the Filipino-American forces there was a general named Douglas MacArthur, uh, who seemed to feel that uh, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor had no effect upon uh, his position in the Philippines. And Douglas MacArthur had a very bad day, his first day as the wartime commander. His time in the Philippines didn't get much better because the Japanese amphibious attacks in the Philippines quickly reduced the Filipino-American uh, forces to a small uh, peninsula called Bataan, B-A-T-A-A-N, which is a peninsula, roughly an island connected to the Philippines. That makes it not an island, but a peninsula from the mainland. This was right off the uh, Manila Bay in the city of Manila. Uh, they would hold out they would hold out for some time until may 8th 1942. Uh, macarthur would be ordered out he would be ordered out uh, the navy would uh, take him in secret uh, to australia where he began to uh, uh, assemble american troops for the counterattack against japan uh, macarthur was highly regarded by the republican party in the united states and also he was a symbol of american victory in world war one so Roosevelt, uh, to placate the Republicans and also to satisfy general American public opinion, had ordered MacArthur out. Uh, 76,000 American Filipino troops surrendered to the Japanese. This was the largest surrender of American troops to a foreign enemy in American history. Still is. Uh, notice I didn't count the Civil War because that was Americans surrendering to Americans. But uh, this 76,000 force is our largest surrender in military history. The Japanese regarded 
anyone who surrendered as less than manly, less than human. Uh, they regarded the individual as someone who had betrayed his family and betrayed his country. The Japanese soldier would swear to fight to the death, to die for the emperor, to die for the family, to die for Japan was a warrior's highest honor. To do otherwise would disgrace the family. You could essentially never be accepted back home. The Americans and Filipinos surrendered. The Japanese were not prepared to accept the surrender of 76,000 men, many of whom were near starvation, many of whom were wounded, many of whom were sick. Instead, the Japanese forced them to walk the length of this peninsula and further to roughshod prisoner of war camps. This is some 76,000 men. Of that force of 76,000, somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to 10,000 would die on what was called the Bataan Death March. Seven to 10,000, of which it is estimated roughly 3,300 were American. The others were Filipino, our allies, our allies uh, in this conflict. The Japanese would murder those men who felt they could not go any further and would sit down or fall down. Uh, they would be bayoneted. They would be shot. Uh, Japanese officers with their samurai swords would behead them. They would be thrown into a lake if they went to get water because they were dying of thirst, they would be thrown into a lake and shot in the lake so they would die with water around them. Uh, the Japanese behaved as cruelly as the Nazis had ever behaved. Indeed, throughout this conflict, the Japanese treated their prisoners, be they Chinese, American, Australian, British, Indian, Burmese, Russian, they treated their prisoners with little more than murder in mind. Uh, the loss rate among Japanese prisoners, uh, the, the people Japanese took prisoner, was astronomical. Was astronomical. Uh, I had the uh, the uh, difficult experience of uh, uh, working with a, a survivor of the Bataan Death March and a man who also survived until his uh, prisoner war camp was liberated by American forces later on, about four years later. And uh, there was very little left to this man mentally. He was uh, almost childlike, almost childlike. Uh, he was a nice guy, very decent man. I got to know him fairly well. And uh, another one uh, made some major uh, contributions to the college library. And I got to speak to him at, uh, at several points. And uh, uh, he just wanted people. He donated books on World War II in the Pacific because he wanted people to remember what he and his friends had gone through and, uh, so that their memories could be kept alive. Yeah, uh, you know, you may leave the war, but the war doesn't necessarily leave you. At the same time, the Philippines would have been captured by the Japanese. The naval base, the British naval base in Singapore, you know, would be uh, captured, and 85,000 British, Australian, and Indian army troops in, serving under the British. India was in the British Empire. They would surrender as well. Burma would be taken. The Dutch East Indies would be taken. And any Dutch civilian who had anything to do with setting the oil fields on fire, so the Japanese could not take advantage of them, they were murdered, as were their families, as were their families. Japan, by the spring of 1942, had conquered the empire. You will see in the uh, uh, in the first map you see in in my PowerPoint uh, attached to this module. In doing so, the Japanese had only lost. 15,000 soldiers and sailors and airmen, 15,000, and they conquered an area vastly larger than the one, they, the one they already possessed in their possessions in China and in Japan, in Japan. It was startling, it was startling. The uh, American response, uh, because 
it took time for the U.S. to gear up for war now against uh, Japan and Germany. And remember the ABC One conversations, the Americans and British had agreed that the Germans would come first. So that, in a way, further delayed the American uh, counterattack against Japan. However, the U.S. Navy, under the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Ernest King, uh, was uh, not necessarily going to wait uh, and pay strict attention to this Germany first policy. Admiral King wanted to strike back at the Japanese, and uh, he would arrange that the Navy would be uh, sufficiently reinforced to do so, uh, to do so. And indeed, it did happen in the Coral Sea, uh, which if you just take a look at Japan and drop your eyes due south, you will see this large island mass of New Guinea, Papua New Guinea, and under that will be the Coral Sea. The Coral Sea will uh, will wash ashore on the uh, the continent of Australia, Papua New Guinea, and an island chain that will kind of keep on dipping further south. Uh, the island of Guadalcanal would be in that island chain, in the Solomon Islands, it's called. But at any rate, the the Japanese were quite interested in seizing uh, the air base in, in New Guinea and also threatening Australia. And uh, so the Japanese had sent a naval expedition which included two aircraft carriers, two of the carriers that had struck Pearl Harbor. Uh, this was going on in May, 1942. The Americans, to protect their Australian forces, uh, the Americans and the Australian forces building up in Australia, and also to deny the Japanese any airfields around the Coral Sea, the United States would meet this Japanese carrier group with two aircraft carriers of our own, the Lexington and the Yorktown, two pre-war American aircraft carriers. Uh, this naval battle, the Battle of the Coral Sea on May 7, 1942, was, well, it was, filled with errors by both sides. Uh, neither side had fought a carrier against carrier battle before. Well, we can excuse that, uh, but the uh, the Americans did lose the carrier Lexington. She went down with a decent percentage of her crew and of course, all her airplanes. The Yorktown was damaged. The Japanese had lost one very small carrier, uh, not a fleet carrier, not a main carrier, but a smaller one and but had lost a number of naval aviators so that the uh, and uh, one of the carriers was slightly damaged so those two aircraft carriers were immediately removed because they had lost too many of the air crew and one had been had been damaged the yorktown managed to get back to pearl harbor now this is may 1942 the turning point of the war the battle of midway is in june 1942 the, the Yorktown got back to Midway and the equipment and the, uh, the damage to the Yorktown was uh, immediately taken in hand by the uh, Navy, uh, Navy West sailors and civilian workmen who would be working 24 hours a day to repair what had to be repaired on Yorktown and to give her the additional aircraft she needed because American intelligence, we had broken the Japanese naval code, American intelligence indicated that Admiral Yamamoto was bringing his forces to bear to strike at the island of Midway, northwest of Hawaii. And it was felt that if this vital airfield on Midway was taken by the Japanese, that Hawaii would be left partially naked and the Japanese uh, naval aircraft would again be able to strike at Pearl Harbor. Now, this Battle of Midway uh, would serve to be the first true American victory of, of this war, of this war. It would result in, in a, by just a stroke of luck, that the American aircraft out looking for Japanese carriers found them at a very opportune moment because the dive bombers to attack the Japanese carriers had come in first and dive bombers would be level 
flying aircraft who then to drop their bomb would die on the aircraft carrier. As it was diving, it would release the bomb. The bomb would then fly in front of the airplane. That's just in, uh, just energy and, and uh, gravity and motion. And the dive bomber would pull out of its dive and fly away. That meant that the fighter cover over the Japanese aircraft carriers would dive down to strike the American dive bombers. When the torpedo bombers in the next wave of American attacks would come over, the dive, I'm sorry, I got that totally backwards. The torpedo bombers came in first. <sighs> Pardon. Jeez. Yeah, maybe I should stop now and just go somewhere and refuel my brain. At any rate, the torpedo bombers came in first that were massacred by the Japanese fighters, and then in came the dive bombers, and everything I said about the dive bombers would hold true. They would strike three of the four Japanese carriers, and these carriers would sink. This was just a magic moment uh, for the United States naval aircraft. The fourth Japanese carrier would be destroyed later. All four of the Japanese carriers in the Midway Strike Force had been sunk, had been sunk. In return, Japanese naval aviators managed to sink the Yorktown. So the Yorktown continued her string of bad luck. The Americans now had the initiative. The Japanese aircraft carrier force, the main striking element of the Japanese Navy, had been badly hurt. They lost those four pre-war carriers in most of their excellent, well-trained aircrew. Uh, one of the Japanese carriers in the Coral Sea had lost nearly all of its aircrew and uh, been damaged, and the other carrier had lost significant amounts of its aircrew. So Japan had to retrain their naval aviators. This gave the United States the chance to have a formal counterattack. And indeed, that came in August 1942. Notice the use of months and days and, and years here. Yamamoto had promised the Japanese military that he couldn't guarantee anything after a strike on Pearl Harbor. He said he knew the Americans, he spoke English and read English, and he knew about American industrial potential, power. And he said, the best I can offer you is I will run wild for six months and after that, I can't guarantee anything. By the time of Midway, six months had gone by since December 1941. An amazing prediction, amazing prediction. The first American offensive action against Japan would be in August 1942 in the Solomon Islands. Again, check your PowerPoints for this, S-O-L-O-M-O-N. Uh, where the Japanese were constructing an airfield to interfere with uh, the American uh, ships going back and forth to Australia, carrying supplies and troops, Australia and New Zealand, who were both involved in this war on, on the Allied side. Uh, this airfield represented a danger. And what the United States did is it got together uh, by scrambling as fast as it could, it got together the 1st Marine Division loaded it on transports, took it from New Zealand to Guadalcanal, the island where the airfield was being built, G-U-A-D-A-L-C-A-N-A-L, Guadalcanal. And on August 7th, 1942, the Marines landed. The few Japanese troops there were all construction troops. They took to the hills mostly and radioed Japanese high command that the Americans had landed. Uh, the Japanese were shocked at this, but uh, quickly sent, got together a scratch naval force uh, that had never operated together before. These, uh, uh, these rough, uh, eight uh, Japanese warships, they steamed down at night uh, to Guadalcanal and in a battle at Savo Island, off Savo Island, S-A-V-O, uh, right off the, uh, the coast of Guadalcanal, they managed to do incredible damage uh, to American warships, surface warships, and uh, sink a number of, of cruisers, including one Australian cruiser. This was not a good night for the United States Navy. It was, uh, the Navy had radar, 
but uh, many of their radar operators didn't know how to use it. The Japanese had no radar, but were very skilled in night fighting, very skilled in night fighting. This was the opening of the six month campaign for control of Guadalcanal. Uh, the Japanese nickname for Guadalcanal was Starvation Island. Uh, the Japanese troops would be sent there by merchant ships, by warships, but they were not able to supply them with sufficient amounts of food. Japanese logistics from beginning to end of this conflict was probably as less than professional than the logistics support of the Confederate Army. It was horrible. It was horrible. Uh, cannibalism became common in Guadalcanal amongst the Japanese forces. And many of these men would die of sickness, would die of starvation. Uh, they would uh, not necessarily be killed by, by the American Marines or the American Navy. There would be air battles, sea battles, and ground battles at Guadalcanal. Uh, this was a very vicious struggle. This would begin the myth that Japanese soldiers had been trained in jungle warfare in Japan before the war. No one bothered to tell the American military, apparently, that Japan then and now does not have jungles as part of the Japanese islands. No, uh, the Japanese army proved it could adapt, and adapt it did uh, quicker than the Americans, but Americans also adapted. At the end of this time, the casualty figures are still a little fuzzy. Uh, the Japanese estimate that they had lost 25,600 25, soldiers, they estimate. And the Navy, the IJN, had, was not able to even estimate the total number of sailors lost in the naval battles. The Japanese had lost one aircraft carrier, two battleships, four cruisers, 12 destroyers, and six submarines. That amounts to a, a major naval battle. Uh, the United States losses on land were given at 6,400. That doesn't count the casualties from malaria, dengue fever, and other sicknesses common in, uh, in unhealthy tropical environments like that. That is only combat losses. Uh, also, the Amer United States had lost two carriers, eight cruisers, and 14 destroyers. American ships could be quickly replaced by American industry. America's population was much larger than the Japanese population. You could replace the, the soldiers, the airmen, the Marines, the sailors. The Japanese could not replace the warships. Japanese industry was not strong enough. The Japanese did not have the steel that it had hoped to import, nor was the oil supply safe because of American submarines. And what the battle did prove to the American fighting man and the American public is that no matter what the terrain was like, be it jungle or be it mountains or whatever, the American soldier would be able to fight the Japanese and win. The Japanese myth of superiority in hand-to-hand in -hand combat was forever dispelled. In addition to this, uh, in Australia, MacArthur, in, uh, in, in using both Australian and American troops, would begin a campaign on New Guinea, directly north of Australia. MacArthur's aim was to return to the Philippines, as he had promised the Filipino people he would do. He would do. That was the Southwest Pacific area of operations, theater of operations. The Central Pacific theater of operations was run by the Navy. So you had two different American high commands here. Southwest Pacific based in Australia under MacArthur, Central Pacific based in Hawaii under Admiral Chester Nimitz. Nimitz is spelled N as in nighttime, uh, I-M-I-T-Z, uh, Admiral Chester Nimitz, brilliant officer a brilliant officer. Uh, Nimitz uh, would be the one who would be in command of those famous Marine and Army amphibious attacks on Japanese-held islands. Uh, most Americans are totally unaware 
that there was a ground war in Papua New Guinea or a ground war in the Philippines. Uh, everyone has heard of Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, etc. Very few people have heard of uh, the battle in Leyte or the battle on Luzon, uh, the ground campaigns that the army was engaged in. At any rate, the army did stage more amphibious operations than the United States Marine Corps did in the Pacific. So for all you soldiers out there, tell that to the Marines when you get an opportunity and then duck and then duck. Uh, but the that pre-war planning that I mentioned in the last lecture of the Navy and the Marines and the design of these special, uh, these special boats and ships used in amphibious warfare uh, would pay off. They would also be the setting, these amphibious attacks, for some of the most grueling uh, and vicious fighting in the war in the Pacific. The first American amphibious assault was an island called Tarawa. That's spelled T as in Thomas, T-A-R-A-W-A, -A Tarawa. It's in the Gilbert Islands, G-I-L-B-E-R-T. You'll see that on a map in the PowerPoint. Uh, this was a rather tiny uh, place, uh, uh, 300 acres. It, uh, the island itself is not called Tarawa. It's called Bitio. B E T I O, but it is popularly known in the United States as Tarawa, so the battle became Tarawa. This was the scene for the 2nd Marine Division, 2nd uh, Marine Division's amphibious attack. The 1st Marine Division was mainly responsible for Guadalcanal. The 2nd Marine came in there, and an Army Division also came in there, but the 1st Marine was then exhausted and had to refit and, uh, uh, and, and work on building itself up again. The 2nd Marine Division went in. This operation was the first operation under enemy fire, first amphibious attack under enemy fire. There was a reef, uh, an underground, and a bit of it was above ground, uh, in separating the lagoon at Tarawa, where the landing beaches were, from the Pacific Ocean. It was felt that at high tide, the, Marine, the Navy landing craft could easily get over the lagoon and bring the Marines directly onto the shore. Uh, that wasn't true. That wasn't true. Uh, most of the naval landing craft were hung up on the reef. That means the Marines, their ramps would go down and the Marines had to walk on many, many hundreds of yards by hold, holding their rifle, uh, any military equipment, uh, they would hold it over their heads as they would essentially walk through the water. The tide is usually coming in, of course, and they would be walking, uh, wading through the water very, very slowly while under fire, while under fire. There were 4,500 Japanese troops on this 300-acre island, uh, which had this large airfield essentially right in the middle of it. Uh, the Americans that survived in the first wave would get to the beach and manage to, to disperse a number of the uh, machine guns and artillery pieces firing on the, on the next waves of Marines coming in. But uh, it would take 76 hours, day and night combat, before the Japanese were essentially annihilated. In other words, before they were killed, because they wouldn't give up. Again, remember that Japanese ethic of no surrender. The total loss to the Americans was 3,500. About 1,200 of these were dead. Uh, the island of Tarawa is on the equator. And the, uh, the videos taken of that will show uh, marine bodies drifting back and forth on the tide and then being washed up on the shore, drifting back on the tide, washed up on the shore. This is tough stuff to watch. You can view it on YouTube. I would just as soon not show that to you because you know a number of students just do not want to see that. But just call up Tarawa on, on YouTube and you can easily, uh, you can see it and uh, reflect upon that. Those are your great grandparents, probably. That's their generation, uh, or grandparents, my parents' generation. Okay. Uh, the second division had done had done their duty. There were 100 prisoners taken. Uh, most of the prisoners, the overwhelming majority of them, were Korean laborers that the Japanese 
uh, essentially just used to do all the dirty work and building the defenses on the island. They did not take the oath to die for the emperor. If they did take it, the Japanese made them and they had no intention of honoring it. Uh, no, so many of the prisoners that the US said it took were not Japanese soldiers, but Koreans who'd been uh, uh, drafted into construction service. The next island, now the, this airfield on Tarawa guaranteed that there'd be ground air support for the next offensive. This idea of the Navy taking the Marines and Army uh, two islands, they would bypass any number of other Japanese islands because they didn't need to take every island in the middle of the Pacific. No, those that would not lend itself to easy construction of large airfields, they would simply bypass. Let the Japanese sit there and starve. They don't have any airplanes. There's no airport there, no landing field. We can bypass them and go to the ones that we will need to build up our air strength on these captured airfields to go on to the next island hopping campaign. Also, the Americans had more than enough aircraft carriers carrying their airplanes with them uh, as they went to make, be certain that they had ground-based air support for the future. Okay, that would bring them to the Marianas Islands. Marianas is spelled M-A-R-I-A-N-A-S. The Marianas. This was the setting for three main Japanese islands. The island of Guam, G-U-A-M, still an American air base today. The island of Tinian, T as in Thomas, I-N-I-A-N, and the island of Saipan, S as in Sam, A-I-P-A-N. All of these islands made superb air bases. Indeed, the B-29 bombers that would take off with the atomic bombs for Japanese cities, they took off from the island of Saipan and the island of Tinian. These attacks were made in June 1944, and this forced the Japanese rebuilt naval air force to come out yet again. Japan had managed to scrounge together their other aircraft carriers, and it even built a few new ones. And the Japanese aircraft carrier fleet came out to do battle with the American aircraft carrier force because the Japanese knew that Saipan, Guam, and Tinian were vital to the Japanese defensive shield. Defensive shield. Uh, and the contest for the Marianas would include ground fights on all three of these islands, but the Battle of the Philippine Sea, what this naval battle is called, would see the absolute destruction of the Japanese aircraft carrier force. Uh, Japan's Navy, the, the Navy that they brought out was still a large fleet, a large fleet, but the airmen were essentially, they were, they were not even half trained. Uh, a number of these young men, had uh, had just basic flight training. Uh, they couldn't read a map over the water. Uh, they were very unskilled in in uh, in using their the weapons they carried on board, be they torpedoes or be they bombs, or they were just unskilled as fighter pilots in protecting the dive bombers and and uh, torpedo aircraft. The result: uh, the United States fleet of 15 aircraft carriers, seven battleships and almost 1,000 planes, almost 1,000 naval aircraft, would manage to destroy three of the Japanese carriers with help from submarines, three Japanese carriers, and 426 Japanese naval aircraft. That included the overwhelming majority of the crews. All of these recently or partially trained men, plus the few veterans, they were mostly lost. They were mostly lost. Uh, the United States would lose 130 airplanes, but only 76 aircrew. Only 76 aircrew. Uh, the other aircrew were rescued. Were rescued. The Japanese Naval Air Force, Carrier Air Force, was doomed. It was gone. It was gone. The Marianas gave the Americans 
bases for the B-29s, the B-29s. This was the most highly developed heavy bomber of the war. And indeed, for periods after the war, uh, the B-29s would begin a bombing campaign against Japan, which quickly grew in intensity. The more B-29s were produced, the more the crews were trained and then sent to the Pacific. The first raid was 80 bombers on November 24, 1944, uh, flying at high altitude daylight attacks. The initial raids were the subject of very mixed reviews. Uh, the bombing was very inaccurate. And also the wind worked against the high level American bomber attacks. This wasn't the bomber force, the same bomber techniques that worked in Europe. High altitude bombing would not work in the jet stream over Japan. A new commander of the B-29 force was brought in. We've heard of him before, uh, ex-commander of the 8th Air Force, Curtis LeMay, L-E-M-A-Y, Curtis LeMay. Uh, as rough a character as he was in command of the 8th Air Force. Curtis LeMay came to the Marianas and instantly, almost instantly, uh, changed the bombing technique from high-level to low-level bombing by four-engine bombers, low-level bombing. Uh, this was not a good news to the bomber air crew or their commanders. Uh, they resisted this, but LeMay said, I'm going to do it even better. I'm going to remove the machine gunners and the machine guns that protect this, these B-29s. And I'm going to send you in at low altitude, but you won't have to worry about defending yourselves because you're going to go in night bombing. Japanese had no night fighter force to speak of. And you're going to go in, you're not going to be carrying high explosive bombs. You're going to be carrying incendiary bombs, fire bombs. Americans new Japanese cities were mostly made out of wood. German cities are mostly made of concrete steel. There were some wood, but European cities were by and large uh, infinitely more modern. And fire, while it did damage German cities and, and London, fire would absolutely obliterate Japanese cities because, well, wood burns. In they came at night. And uh, the raids were February 25th, 1945, was the first uh, incendiary attack on, on the city of Tokyo. And it burned nearly one full square mile of the city. One full square mile. That wasn't enough for LeMay. And the significant, the most significant fire raid of World War II uh, was on the night of March 9th and 10th, 1945, when a fleet of 300 B-29 bombers flew in low level, dropping 2,000 tons of incendiary devices on the city of Tokyo, the city of Tokyo. It destroyed 25% of the city, again, mostly made of wood, and killed approximately 85,000 people in one night in one night. Others would die of their injuries later. The Japanese have always placed the figure at 85,000. It could very well be over 100,000. Uh, either way, it's just a terrific loss of life. These are all civilians, or mostly civilians, by the way, mostly civilians. The Americans in the bombing of Germany had realized that Norden bomb sign and pinpoint accurate bombing didn't work in the daylight, they had agreed with the British that area bombing, uh, or in other words, city bombing, uh, was the was the ticket. Uh, while Americans would still say they were bombing industrial areas, uh, the truth is American and British bombers in Europe were, were just bombing uh, mass areas of cities, city busting, city busting. And the American Army Air Forces in Japan, their war was all aimed at the Japanese civilian labor force, the civilians, uh, grandmothers, grandfathers, you know, the, the small, uh, the old, uh, the healthy, the unhealthy. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. If you burn down an enemy's cities, the thought was it remained that civilian would, morale would break. This is air bomber theory. Uh, 
that civilian morale would break. It didn't work against the Germans. It did not work against the Japanese until the two atomic bombs. It didn't work, for that matter, against the North Vietnamese in the Vietnam War. It didn't work against uh, our enemies in Iraq and Afghanistan, although that was not massive area bombing, but it was an awful lot of bombs being dropped. Uh, air power does serve a function, but it has to work in conjunction with, uh, with land power. You have to put boots on the ground more often than not. Uh, the total number of bombs dropped on Japan by the B-29s primarily, uh, roughly 170,000 tons. Approximately between three and 500,000 Japanese were killed. 8,500,000 Japanese were made homeless from a population of about 72 or 3 million, 8 million 500,000. And again, these, these are round numbers. Uh, the actual number that can never be known. So Japan's infrastructure was being destroyed. Her naval air force had been destroyed. Her navy was well on the way to destruction. Her army was being defeated in these island campaigns and in the fighting in, in the in Papua New Guinea and, and soon in the Philippines. And it was also still heavily invested in China, still heavily invested in China. Well, what about those imports that the Japanese economy, Navy and Army so desperately needed to continue this war? Well, there was another factor going on that was very much a negative for Japan. And this one is usually neglected by people that uh, have looked at the, at the war in the Pacific. I had mentioned it's a naval and air war. Part of the naval war was the American submarine force. The German submarine force had gone to war in two world wars and had failed in both of them. The American submarine force had, has gone to war in one mass large conflict, and that's the war against Japan and the Pacific. And this was an astonishing, stupendous victory for the American submariner. Uh, the submarine crews on a submarine, they're called submariners, not submariners. But Amer the American submarine force under the command of Admiral Lockwood, L-O-C-K-W-O-O-D, from the instant war began with the attack on Pearl Harbor, they were ordered to sink any and every Japanese ship that they could encounter, uh, everyone. Uh, and this, uh, and in this war, as well as the war in Europe, uh, German hospital ships, Italian hospital ships, and Japanese hospital ships were also targeted. Some of them were not plainly marked, to be honest with you, but uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, submarine war, uh, the first duty of a submarine crew is to protect themselves in their boat. Again, a submarine is not a ship, it's a boat. And that meant that they would fire uh, either submerged or on the surface, but they would not give warning. And they would sink their opponent sink their opponent. The U.S. submarine force early in the war suffered from tremendous difficulties with the technology of the, of the pre-war torpedo. They didn't work. They didn't work. Uh, they were not tested properly by the pre-war uh, submarine force. Uh, and the officers in the pre-war submarine force were not trained to act as aggressively as German U-boat officers had been in both of their wars and the Royal Navy submariners had been in both World War I and World War II. Admiral Lockwood changed that, changed that. Uh, he replaced uh, sub commanders who weren't up to the job, promoted those who he could trust to do the job and trained others to take over uh, new submarines as they were being built. Uh, the result, nearly 1,300 Japanese merchant ships would be destroyed by the United States submarine. 1,300 Japanese merchant ships were sunk. In addition, the United States submarine sank <clears throat> one battleship, eight aircraft carriers of various sizes, and 11 cruisers. Again, the warship just one step down from a battleship. I won't even tell you the number of smaller warships that it sank, that the submarine sank. 
the United States put 288 submarines into the war effort, most of them brand new uh, because of American production. And uh, we lost 52 of the 288 uh, submarines. Most of them went down with all their crew, all their crew uh, still on board. Uh, it's a dangerous way to make a living, a dangerous way to make a living. Uh, these United States submarine commanders, uh, they made a habit of attacking Japanese warships. German submarine commanders usually didn't do that unless, I mean, they really had an opportunity to do so or if they were ordered to do so. Uh, but the American submarine officers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, these, these guys were, uh, <laughs> they were the best and the brightest. Uh, these are the guys that you always want to, to lead you into a, in, in a place of danger. Uh, they will lead you into the danger, but they'll do their best to get you back out of there. Uh, but you're certainly going to make headlines in being led by them. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, uh, that is absolutely for sure. American uh, power in the Pacific uh, by 1943 uh, fully illustrated that uh, this Germany first uh, strategy just it wasn't relevant. It wasn't relevant. Uh, the Americans had so much in the way of, of production of weapons and ships and so many men being mobilized into all the various services that they could fight two wars in two different parts of the world simultaneously. That's the power of, uh, of a, a group of people who are united in war and also have the industrial power and potential to wage war. Uh, it also helped that you had the Japanese, Italian, and German high commands, political and military, that were, uh, uh, let's just say, they were not nearly as talented as the high commands in the uh, in the United Kingdom, in the United States, and in Russia. Uh, they were nowhere near as competent. Uh, by early 1944, Allied forces under MacArthur and Nimitz had reached the point where they had to decide, where do we go now that we have pretty much taken this, the all that what we needed in the Central Pacific? Uh, the Navy had even established huge supply bases on liberated islands in the uh, in the Central Pacific, and MacArthur uh, was on the verge of invading the Philippines. The Navy resisted invading the Philippines. They didn't think it was necessary. Uh, MacArthur used his uh, his um, influence, what he had over. President Roosevelt convinced Roosevelt that uh, uh, the Philippines were necessary uh, to keep the Japanese airfields from uh, interfering with American invasion plans uh, by the Navy. And also he convinced Roosevelt that the Filipino people that he had promised he would return, that we needed their, their friendship in a post-war world. The Philippines would be independent very soon after the end of World War II. Everyone knew that. Uh, and he said, we need these people to remember that Americans would not have left them in the lurch under a very brutal Japanese occupation. Roosevelt listened and, uh, and went along. So MacArthur's invasion counterattack into the Philippines was uh, proceeding along with a great deal of help from the United States Navy. The island that would be uh, island in the Philippines, the Philippines is a series of islands. Uh, you can see that on a map. Uh, but the uh, the island where the uh, MacArthur concentrated was the island of Leyte, L-E-Y-T-E, -E, uh, roughly halfway uh, in the uh, up the, the chain of the Filipino islands. L-E-Y-T-E. -E. His, uh, his tactic was to seize the island and build air, airfields there so that we didn't have to rely upon uh, American naval power anymore. We could just uh, have the Army Air Forces uh, build their airfields and run Army Air Force planes to protect the further attacks by the ground forces in the Philippines. <laughs> well, you know, MacArthur has a very good reputation uh, among a number of military historians, but, uh, uh, you know, he had dropped the ball uh, when Japan first uh, attacked the Philippines in 1941. And uh, uh, and that was the result of uh, MacArthur. And uh, he also made kind of a significant mistake in the planning for the return to the Philippines when he was going to be building these air bases on Leyte. Well, uh, 
the Leyte soil, the soil on that island, it's a big island. Uh, the soil just isn't strong enough. The terrain doesn't uh, uh, isn't capable of holding that much weight of concrete or whatever you're building the uh, the airfields of and then all the buildings and the supply areas that are going to be stacked on top of it plus all of the troops that are going to be there and plus all the aircraft none of which are lightweight are going to be there uh, the army corps of engineers had a terrific amount of time building airfields on Leyte. so uh, there's my uh, feeling about douglas macarthur i'm going to be reading a paper by a student about MacArthur. Uh, you don't have to take take uh, take my opinion into it, sir. You just follow whatever the research leads you to follow, and uh, I'm not going to mark you off just because I disagree with. You. Trust me on that. I'll mark you off because you're wrong. <laughs> Couldn't resist it, sir. Forgive me. Okay. Uh, the islands would uh, all of the Philippines would be conquered uh, by the Americans, with the exception of part of the uh, uh, of the northernmost northernmost part. Of, of the uh, of the island chain and uh, their uh, Japanese troops would uh, would surrender once they once they had heard that the uh, the government of Japan had indeed surrendered uh, and that would not be until September 1945 uh, the uh, Leyte is of great interest though because this was the scene of the last attempt of the Japanese fleet to delay the American conquest. Uh, Philippines, of course, would give the Americans air bases everywhere, but late air bases to use uh, in mounting strikes against the Japanese forces in China, as well as in the home islands. So they had to defend it uh, with ground troops and what air, air fields they still had, what airplanes they still had. And the Navy was honor bound uh to make one last attempt to stop the americans the japanese did have four aircraft carriers left that were able to sail these four aircraft carriers could only carry 116 planes though and the pilots of these 116 planes were let's just say they were not well trained not well trained this was a desperate gamble on the part of the japanese since their carriers could not present any threat to the Americans, any real threat, but they could present a symbolic threat. The Americans didn't have to, well, they didn't know that these aircraft carriers were carrying so few planes and so few poorly trained pilots. So they would offer their aircraft carrier force, what was left of it, as bait to draw the American carrier force away from the Philippines, and that will enable three other sections of the Japanese fleet, all of them surface warships, battleships, cruisers, destroyers, to be able to attack the U.S. fleet off Leyte, which was the amphibious force that was supplying the Americans on Leyte and bringing in reinforcements and ammunition. This was the Japanese Navy's theory that they could do that. Well, it turned out that small uh, aircraft carrier force did serve as bait. Uh, a very famous American admiral named William Halsey, H-A-L-S-E-Y, whose nickname was Bull, and uh, he was quite a fighter. And uh, Bull Halsey took the bait and went roaring north with uh, his aircraft carriers and brand new American battleships. He was eager to destroy the Japanese aircraft carrier force. Well, he did, but it it didn't matter because uh, he sank all those carriers and all those planes were destroyed, as were some other warships. But uh, he had abandoned his responsibility to protect the amphibious fleet back in the Philippines, back in the Philippines. The uh, Japanese fleet with of those carriers and the other sections uh, of the Japanese fleet uh, included uh, uh, nine battleships and 16 cruisers as well as a number of destroyers they would sail in to the battle of leyte gulf which took place between october 23 and 25 1944. Uh, the americans uh, had 
34 aircraft carriers, again, of all sizes, fleet carriers, the big ones, the main carriers, light carriers, smaller versions, and escort carriers, which were very, very small and uh, had no protection whatsoever. Uh, the United States Navy also had 10 battleships, 24 cruisers, and so many support ships, uh, so many amphibious assault vessels, uh, uh, sophisticated radar supplies, endless amounts of ammunition, and more than 1,400 naval aviators that the Japanese fleet truly did not have a chance. Uh, that turned out to be true in action. The Leyte Gulf would see the Japanese lose all four aircraft carriers, three battleships, 10 cruisers, 11 destroyers, and one submarine. The United States lost three small escort carriers and three destroyers. Uh, the number of sailors lost uh, can never be actually computed. The Japanese uh, Navy, the pride of Japan before the war, the very symbol of the Japanese imperial strength was forever gone. There would be one more strike by a Japanese battleship in the last battle of the war at Okinawa, and it went on a suicide mission that would result in its sinking as well. This is the famous Yamato, Y-A-M-A-T-O battleship, uh, one of the two largest battleships ever built. A one sunk in the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the Musashi, M-U-S-A-S-H-I, and the other, the Yamato, which survived only be to be destroyed again by American air power. MacArthur had returned to the Philippines. Uh, he had kept his, his word. A new tactic came into being uh, by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor. Indeed, this tactic was one that uh, the only significant new tactic uh, that the Japanese were responsible for in this entire war. And that was a very peculiar form of warfare. It was essentially war by suicide. Again, the Japanese refused to surrender. Uh, the honor code uh, would not permit uh, the Japanese to surrender. It would disgrace the soldier, the soldier's family, and it would disgrace the emperor and the empire. Well, the Japanese would now use pilots who volunteer to strike the American naval, Navy by smashing their aircraft into American ships. These were suicide, suicide missions. Uh, many times they would be given enough gasoline, uh, aviation fuel uh, to come back to the airfield if they couldn't find the fleet. Other times they were only given what was on hand, which is maybe just enough to get to where they hoped the Americans were. If not, the plane would simply just end up diving into the sea as it ran out, ran out of fuel. Uh, the pilots were, again, uh, marginally trained, very marginally trained. Most of them in the early times uh, were college students or college graduates. They were very young, between the ages of 20 and, and uh, 21, call it 19 to 24, would be the, uh, uh, the, uh, that age range. And uh, nearly all volunteers, nearly all volunteers. They willingly stepped up when the uh, Air Force commanders asked for volunteers. It was uh, no surprise that uh, nearly every man in the squadron, uh, the detachment, the unit, would step forward and volunteer to give his life, to knowingly commit suicide in, in the hopes that they could destroy one enemy aircraft carrier, one enemy ship of any kind to contribute to keeping the home islands from being invaded by these Americans, uh, turning themselves into human bombs was the answer. Mass suicide, and indeed, this is what it amounted to being. One of the uh, airstrikes on October 24th, 1944, in the Battle of Leyte Gulf, struck the USS Saint Lo, S T period, L O, uh, Saint Lo, an American, a small carrier, escort carrier. 
it uh, one plane hit this ship and the ship went down quickly. It went down quickly. And all the kamikazes would hit 36 ships and damage 368. They would lose 5,000 airplanes. That meant 5,000 pilots. Two more grueling battles remained, Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Iwo Jima is two words, I-W-O and J-I-M-A. It uh, translated from Japanese, it basically means sulfur island. Iwo Jima is uh, an eight square mile wide, uh, wide and long island. Uh, it's 750 miles south of Tokyo, 700 miles north of Grand, uh, Guam, and 625 miles north of Saipan. It's about five miles long, two and a half miles wide, which is one third the size of Manhattan, Manhattan, the borough in New York City. It's shaped like a pork chop. Uh, it's significant uh, physical uh, piece of terrain was Mount Suribachi, S-U-R-I-B-A-C-H-I, S-U-R-I-B-A-C-H-I, Mount Suribachi. It was a 546 feet high mountain. Uh, the Marines quickly named it Mount Son of a Bitchy because the Japanese forces on this island, roughly 23,000 uh, soldiers, sailors, and some Air Force personnel who've been stranded there, and of course some Koreans, uh, they weren't on the island. The Japanese defensive force was in the island. They were either in Mount Suribachi, or they were underground in the other parts of the island, some of which also included hills. They knew they could not survive. There was no vegetation on Iwo Jima. It's a sulfur island. Uh, the, uh, the sulfur in the soil comes from uh, the, the volcano, which used to be, Suribachi used to be active, and it was very hot. There was no water on the island. Uh, all uh, the Japanese used to catch the water in big barrels they'd leave out, and they'd catch the rainwater. Uh, it's relatively low ground and then climbs in a series of layered levers, lay, layered levels, very loose ground. One Marine said it was like digging in a wheat field, uh, loose wheat, you couldn't dig it. Little vegetation was destroyed by American bombardment. Now, the digging had started right after Saipan and the general in charge, a man named Kubayashi, K U Kuribashi, excuse me, K U R I B A Y S H I. He had been appointed to command, and he, by his mental abilities alone, he figured out how to defend this place. He built 800 bunkers, and many of the, the tunnels he constructed were over a thousand yards long, and some of them were 200 yards deep. 200 yards deep. It has been estimated that the, the, uh, the tunnel system ran for miles when you just put it all together. Uh, they were dug in this complex system of strong points connected by tunnels. That would force the Marines into a lengthy, strong, strong battle of attrition. Attrition is basically, it's like World War I. You just try and kill so many of the other guy that either you kill them all or they'll give up. And that was the Japanese strategy. We will kill as many of them and we will all die in the attempt. All die in the attempt. Uh, it was predicted initially that it would just take a few number of days. Uh, it took six weeks. It took six weeks of three Marine divisions, the third, fourth, and fifth, attacking what is still regarded as perhaps the most heavily defended piece of real estate in the history of warfare, the history of warfare. Uh, it, uh, it would result in Japanese losses of nearly every single man. The only prisoners were a token number of Japanese, but mostly Koreans, and there were very few of them. The United States Marines and Navy would lose 26,821 men. 6,821 would be killed, either in land fighting 
or in sea fighting or in air fighting. Uh, on the top of Mount Suribachi, on uh, after two and a half days of fighting on February 20, October, up, oh, excuse me, uh, February 20, uh, 3rd, 1945, a Marine unit would manage to fight its way to the top of Suribachi. They found a Japanese, a length of Japanese pipe uh, that had been used in constructing something that was now just laying around. Uh, uh, probably been uh, the original installation destroyed by bombing or, or shore bombardment. Uh, they stuck it in a hole and they put a very tiny American flag on it and ran it up the flagpole. Well, the problem was nobody could see it. <laughs> it was too small. So a uh, uh, a young Marine uh, uh, volunteered and ran back down Suribachi and went up to an American uh, landing ship and <laughs> politely asked if he could borrow the uh, the naval vessel's flag for just a couple of minutes. <laughs> and somehow the officer in command of the uh, of the landing craft said, "Why, well, sure, son. Have a good day." <laughs> and the, the young man went running back up the hill. Uh, I swear, you know, God has to invent people like this. <laughs> I mean, God bless them. Uh, and he brought a full-sized American flag up. And this time when it went up, it was seen by all the sailors on the ships, uh, by all the Marines and sailors on land. And the war stopped for just a moment or two and cheers, yells and screams went up from all that could be heard that saluted the American flag. Yeah, at least that's the legend. Is that true? Hey, that's too good a story not to believe in. That's just too good a story. Uh, I'm enough of a sentimentalist to just say, no, nah, that really happened. You can take that to the bank. I'm sure a number of, of uh, Marines, nicknamed Jarheads and sailors uh, who were served as the, uh, as the uh, Marine Corps uh, medical people, the combat medics with the marines would always be sailors who wouldn't carry firearms and the doctors and nurses were all from the navy uh, at any rate i'm sure that uh, uh, those guys all all were having a, having a grin of the six marines not five marines and one navy medic now that's been disproven uh, but the six marines that uh, uh, raised the flag three of the six were killed in the subsequent fighting on iwo jima uh, three of the six, tragically. Uh, we know who each of those figures in the Marine Corps Memorial uh, uh, that is now placed in Washington, D.C., right uh, uh, overlooking the Arlington National Cemetery, very appropriate place to put it. Go see it if you're down there touring. Go see it. It's a magnificent statue to the Marines and, and their, their Navy compadres. Uh, go see it. Uh, on the, uh, it's, uh, all six of those Marines can be identified. They were all based upon the faces of the individuals who were given credit for raising it, uh, given credit for raising it. Uh, so as you look at them, uh, they are the sculptor worked on them from their family's uh, descriptions and photographs of what the men actually looked like. Uh, at the base of the monument are the words of the Secretary of Navy when he himself witnessed uh, this uh, uh, flag raising from a warship uh, off the uh, Iwo Jima coastline, when he turned to the, the men in, uh, around him, the Marines and sailors around him, and he said, let me give you the, make sure I get the quote right. Uh, Uncommon valor was a common virtue. Uncommon valor was a common virtue. Uh, tremendous, tremendous words. Better words were never spoken. If you thought Iwo Jima was bad, next came Okinawa. Okinawa was the last battle in this war. Uh, the amphibious assault would begin on April 1st, 1945, and the battle would end on July 2nd, 1945. It's a large island, still has a marine base on it, by the way, 360 miles southwest of Japan. Any American aircraft could use those airfields that were already there on Okinawa. Operation Iceberg was backed up by a larger invasion fleet than that that it assembled for D-Day in Normandy. Japan had 120,000 troops stationed on Okinawa, 120,000, led by a, a man whose last name, Ushijima, U-S-H-I-J-I-M-A. 
uh, he was as brilliant an officer as Kiribati was on Iwo Jima. He made certain that his defenses did not begin at the beachhead. No, he constructed them further inland where there was more room uh, to build sound uh, bunkers, uh, to dig tunnels connecting the bunkers, and to take advantage of the various types of land uh, ge geography that would aid defense, the terrain would aid the defense. This was both an army and marine operation. Uh, one of the few times uh, the army divisions and marine divisions would go into action uh, side by side. It was a killer. It was a killer because the entire time that uh, this ground fighting and air fighting was going on on Okinawa, Japanese kamikazes were coming by the train load from island, from the Japanese home islands airfields to attack the American fleet that had to stay off Okinawa to protect the troops ashore with their anti-aircraft guns. Uh, the Japanese Navy did send out the Yamato on a suicide mission. She was supposed to just beach herself on an American invasion beach and then keep on firing until she was destroyed. She didn't even get halfway there before American naval air power sank her with nearly all 2,750 crewmen. Yeah, okay. Uh, the Japanese would fight almost to the bitter end. Uh, the American 10th Army commander, General Buckner, would be killed in action, uh, killed in action here, as would, as would, let me get the exact number, uh, United States would lose 7,613 killed and wounded. Uh, no, I'm sorry, killed, and wounded 30,000 Americans. So 30, 37,613 uh, would be killed. Of Japan's 100 and, I said 120,000 troops, that's the far estimate. It could have been as, as low as about 112,000, but at any rate, it is known that 107,500 Japanese soldiers were identified. The others were left buried in caves. Uh, they wouldn't come out. The Americans would throw hand grenades, flamethrowers would be shot in, uh, machine guns would be fired in there. If they, the soldiers still wouldn't come out and surrender, bulldozers would just essentially seal the caves off and the uh, people inside would die of uh, lack of oxygen or die of starvation or disease. Roughly 100,000 Okinawan civilians would also be killed or wounded, uh, roughly 100,000. Uh, it's a shame the Japanese uh, didn't evacuate the civilian population, uh, but they did not do it. The you know, US Navy probably wouldn't have given them the chance to do it either. Uh, the kamikaze attacks would result in uh, an intense, in a very, very large number of Japanese planes shot down. Uh, but just to remind you, uh, 30 ships were sunk by the Japanese, 4,900 sailors were killed by the Japanese kamikazes, and uh, 5,000 sailors were wounded. 263 American ships were damaged. You'll see uh, videos and photographs of these ships. The next target was the uh, projected invasion of Japan. Uh, it was told, it was predicted that uh, after seeing the fighting in the Philippines and in Iwo Jima and Okinawa, uh, American generals and admirals were hesitant about further attacks on the mainland of Japan. Uh, the Army Air Corps said that they could just bomb it into submissions. Uh, American uh, aircraft carrier people said that they could assist and uh, Japan would soon starve or just run out of ammunition, etc. Well, the war would still be going on. American troops would still be based overseas, and an invasion might be necessary anyway. It was felt the chance couldn't be taken. After Japan had finally surrendered, it was, uh, it was learned that there were still approximately 16,000 Japanese aircraft 
able to be used as kamikazes. I'm never certain of that number. Uh, there certainly weren't 16,000 trained pilots or trained mechanics for these aircraft, but uh, there were 16,000. The Japanese army, the Japanese civilian uh, civilians were all uh, uh, said to be ready to commit mass suicidal attacks upon American troops. The alternative was the atomic bomb. Uh, president Harry Truman uh, always said that he was not president of the United States to protect enemy lives. He was president of the United States to protect American lives. You can't argue with that logic. You can't argue with it. You also can't argue with the that that impression that Japan would not give up easily. They hadn't yet. And they were, I mean, they were essentially, I mean, they were wide open to attack by any means, uh, sea, air, and ground. They were wide open. They had no chance to win. And they still would not surrender. They still would not surrender. Uh, the atomic bomb seemed to be the answer to those who made the decision. General Eisenhower thought it was a foolish decision. I believe General MacArthur, can't remember. Uh, I haven't looked at him uh, in, in a while, uh, but I believe he also uh, didn't think it was necessary. Quite a number of American combat officers that had served in Europe, went, once they read the statistics about the losses in Japan, they didn't feel it was necessary. Uh, I will tell you that American ground troops that had been based in Europe had fought the Germans. They were on transport ships going to Asia to assist in the invasion of Japan. They were convinced the atomic bomb was necessary. They'd had enough of war, as had their commanding officers. So it was a somewhat divided opinion. It was left up to the commander in chief of the armed forces, the president of the United States. Truman had replaced the now dead. Roosevelt, and he ordered the first one to be to be used. Uh, the first one was on a plane, a B-29, named Enola Gay, after the pilot Paul Tibbetts, after his mother, E-N-O-L-A-G-A-Y, Enola Gay, first name and middle name. The bomb's nickname was Fat Man. It was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan. In an instant, four square miles of the city and 80,000 people were obliterated. They ceased to exist. Uh, they ceased to exist. Thousands more would die of radiation over the next couple of years. Japan was expected to surrender after that. They did not. One of the reasons is that the Americans hadn't guaranteed the safety of the emperor. Uh, once that happened, uh, Japan would surrender. Uh, yeah. Uh, diplomacy. What can you say? It didn't work, apparently. A second bomb, nicknamed Little Boy, was dropped from a B-29 named Box Car. Uh, the uh, pilot of the B-29 was Captain Bock, B-O-C-K. Playing is all he named, uh, pilot names it. Box, B-O-C-K, apostrophe S, car. Uh, he named it after a car. Uh, it was dropped over the city of Nagasaki uh, on uh, April 9, 1945. No one has really given an adequate count of the dead at uh, Nagasaki. Suffice it to say, it was uh, it was in the neighborhood of Hiroshima, in the neighborhood of Hiroshima. Uh, Nagasaki is a port city surrounded by by mountains, so it uh, the the blast was contained. Uh, after that, uh, the Japanese regretfully uh, surrendered. Unconditional surrender. Uh, the surrender was hopeless. After uh, uh, with, it was just it was inevitable. Uh, after the second bomb, uh, the surrender document was finally signed on board the USS Missouri, an American battleship, on, in Tokyo Bay, on September second, nineteen forty-five, uh, on board the battleship Missouri. Uh, coincidentally, in the Missouri is the home state of President Harry Truman. The uh, Navy officers chose this uh, intentionally as a way to currying favor 
with the president who would decide on future Navy budgets. Uh, don't ever say Navy admirals are stupid and can't play the public relations game. Part of the surrender ceremony uh, is worth mentioning because after General MacArthur, who was in charge of the ceremony, uh, after all of the uh, uh, Japanese uh, officials and a number of allied officials had signed the document, uh, flying overhead, flying over the American and some British warships anchored in, in Tokyo Bay, hundreds of them, flying overhead was a massive, massive number of U.S. Naval aircraft from U.S. aircraft carriers and United States Army Air Force bombers and fighters. There was an endless stream of aircraft flying over the American fleet and flying over the Japanese capital of Tokyo, sending a message to the American fighting man, to the Americans at home, and to the Japanese who'd been recently defeated that American power was responsible for the failure of Japan to attain its goals in this war. This ended the worst single conflict in world history. It also ends this lecture. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, again, stay well, take care of yourselves.